When the British went to war in 1914, its army of 750,000 men was small by European standards and therefore suffered huge casualties in the early battles. Of the next four years, 8 million men were recruited into the British armed forces and almost half of them came from outside UK. Without the service and sacrifice, British would have lost the war. They came from across the empire, from the plains to the mountains, from the tiny islands to the vast continent of Africa, serving on every front from the equator to the optic cycle. Whenever they came from, they served the same cause away from home and some of them never made it back. The European conflicts in 1914 spread like bushfire to the colonies and dominions of European empires. The quarrels became World War I. Taveta, 15th August 1914. A German soldier had crossed to the British East Africa territory through the Taveta border mission to attack the British camp. 5 a.m. in the morning, the then district commissioner was informed of a movement towards the camp and prepared for the possible attack. So through the police post window, he made the first move by shooting a German soldier named Broker, who later succumbed. Of Mr. Hugh Lafontaine, who arrived here in about 1914, early 1914, as the district commissioner for this area. On uh, August the 10th, or thereabouts, 1914, just a week after the war had been declared, he sent one of his trusted rangers, one of his Askaris, across to Moshi to see what was happening with the Germans on the other side of the border there. And the report came back that they were arming themselves and on parade, rations were being issued and ammunition was being issued. La Fontaine immediately got his little police post operational here. I uh, loaded, loaded them up, each one with 100 rounds of 303 ammunition. He made sure he had enough ammunition for his own firearm, which was a, a, a 375 Magnum. It was a sporting rifle. I, not really to be used against humans, but that was the only weapon he had available to himself. Uh, the Germans had already trained, they crossed into Kenya, and obviously they would head towards where there would be um, some uh, security forces. So they were headed to the police station, which is uh, in Tabeta. These guys were on mules. Uh, headed towards uh, the police station. So the first casualty was uh, Mr. Broker. Now Broker was a forest officer in Moshi and uh, actually subsequently died in the morning. Now the Germans had a strategy uh, by uh, crossing through Taveta, they their target number one was to hit Mzima Spring, bomb Mzima Spring, and uh, their target number two was Savo River Bridge. And once they hit the bridge, there will be no supplies into Kenya. I mean, into Nairobi or into Mombasa. And again, there will be no water. Mzima Spring would have been bold, bombed. So uh, the British were using Lake Chala. The Germans, were, sorry, the Germans were using Lake Chala uh, as a water source. So they knew after they do that, they would have uh, stabilized the, uh, the British forces. Since the beginning of the war, carrier corps potter were used through the East African campaign until in the late 1915s, motorized transport arrived in East Africa and the porters made up roads for the trucks. The tighter people were used very much because of their association with the CMS, the Church Missionary Society and the Catholic Mission in Bura, mm -hmm. 
where a lot of the Titus were taught trade skills right. like uh, brick laying and cementing and uh, road works and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The Titus were valuable people, so the railways used them as artisans mm -hmm. and the road uh, pioneers used them as artisans on the road making culverts and this sort of thing right. rather than being porters. It was a war of mobility. Guerrilla tactics fought in tropical jungles and vast swamps. So the first 18 months of the war, there weren't many KAR Askaris in this area mm -hmm. taking part in any fights. So there'd be very few casualties. Um, so there's very little record of those casualties. Mm -hmm. Casualties really started occurring after, after mid-1915, where in, uh, down on the south coast of Kenya, Jassin, there was a major battle there where the three KAR took part in uh, some very severe fighting down there. And then at uh, Latimer and Riata in Taveta, uh, there was some critical fighting going on there. The, the Ascari, the KAR lost 63 soldiers in a matter of minutes though when they walked into a machine gun nest. I, we don't know who they were. In 1916, the British decided to set a railway line from Voi to Maktau with an intention of reaching the Taveta border. This move appeared to be a threat of military strength to the German soldiers, so they later attempted to blow it up at mile 27 military line without a success, but later eventually managed to blow up a culvert next to it, what led to hand-to-hand -hand combat resulting to fatalities in both sides. Also from a German perspective, I mean the German, the German Ascaris were um, trained to within an inch of their lives. Their discipline was absolutely amazing. They were brilliant soldiers. And it, put, it brought um, East Africa up onto, onto a level that you know, they were militarily um, respected. And the war went on. Now the German tactics were guerrilla type of war. They would hit one place. By the time the British reached that place, they wanted to hit another place. And they had perfected that act. Uh, the commander who was uh, uh, a bullet of Obek. The Germans' habit of not giving up made the British introduce an aircraft that helped them monitor the movements since they used guerrilla tactics, and the first flight took off in Mwaktau. Germans didn't give up. They still wanted to make sure the railway was disrupted. Uh, so the British also thought, uh, since these guys uh, was gorilla, they'll hit this place, go to another place, go to another place. They decided to have a plane. So what they did is they ordered a plane, which was a French-made plane, uh, but in pieces. It came up to Voy, and it was actually assembled in uh, Maktau, put together in Maktau, and it took off from Maktau, uh, uh, to go and uh, keep a watch on uh, the German soldiers and also to go and uh, bomb Salaita, which was the main resistance force for the Germans. Moktau is a slow growing shopping center today. But in 1915, it accommodated over 20,000 British troops and the first airstrip in East Africa. Also, this is where an Australian soldier died heroic in an ambush. Lieutenant William Dartnell, born in 1885 in Collingwood, Melbourne, Australia. He was only 15 years old when he enlisted for service in South Africa with the Victorian Mounted Rifles in 1901. 
He later joined the 25th Battalion Royal Facilias as a temporary lieutenant and in April 1915 he sailed for service in British East Africa. German soldiers attacked British military camp and opened fire. William was wounded in the leg during the ambush and insisted on being left behind to allow other wounded companions to be carried away. He later died but when his body was found the following morning, seven enemies were found lying dead next to him. The Germans didn't have much, much intelligence as to who was fighting but they knew those are British soldiers. And they didn't attack him because he was that man, they attacked him. You know, what would happen is uh, between Roy and uh, Mokhtaw, they would have small pockets of uh, uh, army led by an individual. Now this group had Africans, had British, and also had uh, that man was in charge. So they didn't have much information until they came face to face with the uh, uh, Germans who had, uh, uh, were hiding somewhere. So they attacked them and they were not uh, that prepared. So that man was shot on the foot. And some soldiers were actually killed, but others were just injured. Mm -hmm. But then when the Germans realized that the British uh, reinforcement was coming, they retreated a bit. So whatever the British wanted to do was just to uh, evacuate uh, that man and leave the other soldiers who were hurt there and that man refused. Located to the southeast of Mount Kilimanjaro is Salaita Hill, known to many as the Slaughter Hill. On February 12, 1916, bloody battle between the Sash Troupe, British, Indian, Rhodesians and South African troops took place here. The Germans resisted the advance of the Allies who lost 172 soldiers, 138 of them were South Africans. The hill that was once German stronghold now lies isolated and serves as tourist destination near Taveta town. between the Germans and British East Africa was one of the most extraordinary stories of the Great War. One hundred and eight years later, the Commonwealth countries still mourn the fallen heroes and commemorations are conducted every year. What is here with us and uh, what we commemorate every year is because of uh, remembering the people who shed the blood in these battles. It's very important for us in uniform to know that if I die, I will not be forgotten. I will be remembered all through and through. And one thing I would like to probably share with you is uh, the families, wherever they are, they are touched by remembering their loved ones who mm -hmm. departed most of them at a very young age or at probably at the middle age. So it is very important uh, to have that. Each of those cemeteries um, has a number of graves in it um, and it provides us an opportunity to, to remember those specifically that are buried in those cemeteries. But also those handful of people that are buried there are symbolic of, of, the, of the whole uh, commitment and the whole sacrifice of of the many thousands and thousands who participated in the Great War. Some, some would say, some estimates are as high as one million people from Kenya alone participated in the First World War. Uh, and they would have done that principally in two ways, either through being a, an Askari, uh, a conscripted member of the British Army, 
or they would have also been uh, a carrier and they would have been porters to help resupply and to move the troops as they were as they were conducting their military operations. We have uh, really two objectives which is one is to remember the unremembered who um, have gone before us but the second objective as you indicate is to is to provide an opportunity for uh, the local community and the government to, uh, to to find ways of bringing forward that history. You know, we, we've got this First World War obsession with Europe. The European war um, um, ended on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, which is why Remembrance Sunday is um, is is the, the Sunday closest to the 11th. Our war in East Africa ended on the 25th of November. We were two, we were two weeks late, partly logistical. To me, that, I mean, again, this means as Kenya, we can have, or Kenya, East Africa, we can have our own Remembrance Weekend. We had um, soldiers who participated in some of the wars pre-independence, so pre-1963. And um, if they served within a British army, these soldiers, who some of them are most likely very old, some of them passed and they've left widows behind. Um, we can, we, they can receive a sort of token of appreciation on a yearly basis if they are able to apply to the fund that um, is being co-managed by Kenya Defence Forces and the British High Commission. So as a county government, what we want to do is make sure that we've started sensitizing the communities so that they're aware that this kind of assistance is available to them, that they come out and apply for it um, and start benefiting for the services that their family members were able to give um, the country and the British Army pre-independence. Different historians have tried to preserve the history for the future generations to come. James Wilson, a retired hotelier who have authored The Guerrillas of Savo, is one of the battlefield explorers. His efforts to tell World War I stories has resulted to a world-class World War I museum now located at Taita Hill Safari Resort in Taita Taveta County, Kenya. I was looking for artifacts where I would find some empty ammunition uh, cases and things like that, which was proof that a battle took place there. And I would uh, just collect a few pieces as evidence that this particular position that I was in was a site of a gunfight and I would record it, but I wouldn't take, I wouldn't clear the battlefield of, of uh, Infomira. The, I would just take enough to confirm that that position there was, was a battle site and I'd mark it on my map accordingly. And so on, and we went through, I think, nearly 30 battle sites in uh, southeastern Kenya, not only in uh, Taita Taveta, but along the coast as well. Uh, because here in Kenya, nobody knew about these things. William Adilo is the general manager of the resort and plays a great role in guiding tourists and educating locals who visit the museum. Being a niche product in the Kenyan tourism industry, Battlefield Tourism is now growing to be a center of attraction in the world. Kenya is very well known for wildlife tourism and uh, beach tourism. And as a country and as a destination for a long time, we've been trying to diversify to see what else can we do that is different from the rest of the world. As a company, we thought, wait a minute, uh, we have the World War I that was actually fought here. And then we had World War II. But specifically World War I in this particular area of Taita Taveta, was a battlefield because uh, the war was between the British and the Germans then. The Germans were in then Tanganyika. And uh, because the battlefield was here, there were a lot of things that were left behind. And a gentleman called James Wilson, who is also a hotelier, decided to start collecting these artifacts and anything that was left behind after the war. 
We know, though, that there is quite a, a large oral history out there um, that is passed down from generation to generation within the community that, um, that does still exist. And so we're working really hard with uh, some of our historians here to try and capture that oral history um, of the great-great-grandfather who might have been a carrier or might have been an Ascari uh, and who was lucky enough to survive and then uh, married and had children. It's, it's those oral histories that we, that we find so important to bring to life uh, the commitment and the sacrifice of those uh, during that period. But it also allows then the younger generations to, uh, to really understand because quite a lot of uh, the commemoration at the moment is based around the written history um, and that written history focused to a large extent on the European officers and soldiers who were participating here. And so this small uh, museum that we find ourselves in now in Titer Hills Lodge is a great example of where we can bring together the artifacts that are still out there in the battlefields. And one or two of the artifacts that I have found in previous visits are now displayed here. Battlefield tourism is a, um, it's very big in Europe. It is a very um, select group of people. They generally tend to be people that have either lost relatives, had relatives that fought, or they're military historians or people interested in military history. Um, so it is a slightly limited market, but I think in East Africa or here in Kenya, we've got a very unique situation. It was the only part of the British Empire that um, was um, actually uh, was, that was occupied by the Germans so it's unique in that respect. So everything needs to be to be changed and I appreciate the, the investors here has transformed this place it has an experience by bringing the battlefield museum into uh, the the conservancy so there's an issue of conserv conservation there's issue about culture there's issue about history and these are the things that has made us in government be interested and we will come with bigger support in future. Firstly, for you to get a tour of this particular museum, we are not charging. We are not charging a single cent. If you want to make a donation, you are free to do so. So it is all here free. Uh, you can read through, you can access it. However, if you want the guided tour, which takes you to Voi, takes you to Moktau, all these other outdoor places, then you will be charged a fee. How do we reach out to the young people out there? The school kids around the community here have already visited this place. And we've also had a lot of uh, school children and school groups who have been coming to our lodge. And in the process, they've been able to see the, the museum. And we've also been able to take them on a conducted, you know, guided tour. So we're not charging even the people who are not staying with us. If school kids want to come in today, if anything, we even offer them a meal. We even offer them a drink you know, to encourage them to understand this history because their great-great-grandfathers took part in this particular war. Obviously, as each generation goes by, that oral history uh, will naturally diminish, so we've got to try and capture that. And working with uh, the communities, working with the local government, then uh, we think that we can provide an opportunity, A, to capture that history, but B, also then um, to exploit this, the niche market of battlefield tourism and this small museum here uh, in a safari lodge is a great example of that and we know that previous uh, to covid uh, we would have had tourists who came here specifically in order to uh, to enjoy the, the fantastic wildlife but also to then spend a moment uh, to go and view some of the the battlefields and when you go and view those battlefields uh, the fantastic thing is that they haven't been developed there are trench systems still visible to this day uh, there are still artifacts lying around in the trench systems um, that that really bring the story to life um, before covid um, started hitting us quite hard we were looking at our tourism policy and looking at what are the niche products that we need to support as a county government that would then enable the locals um, better benefit from from the potential activity that can happen. Battlefield tourism is one of them. It's very niche. Um, we're one of the only sites in Kenya where you can actually come in and say that you've seen um, a war site where um, all of these activities were happening from the 1914. Today, as we went round, we also went into one of the first um, police posts in Taveta, which was built in 1909. 
So as, as a county, what we're trying to do is ensuring that we have the policy that would then create the enabling environment for private sector players to come in and create proper products, bring in the tourists and be able to navigate the various areas in the county in a manner that then generates jobs as well as income for the communities that are around. Um, we want as much as possible to try and get people to understand what Taita Taveta is about in addition to the wild. So the parks that we have here, you, you're aware the county 62% national park, but we want to be able to explore the other areas in addition to this very um, historic sites and that's how the community will benefit. Of course when tourists are coming in, they're coming in with dollars, they're coming in with euros, um, of course they're also coming in with Kenya shillings and when that remains from the purchase of curios and crafts from our youth and women, then that's how the community starts benefiting. But one other angle that I believe that we can look as an, an, an intangible benefit is us understanding our own culture. What happened in 1914 to 1918 with regards to all of the porters that were being used from the community in Voi, in Watate and in Taveta. Um, there were impacts that were had for the families that were there where the men were taken away, some of them died on the journeys and they've never been properly commemorated and these families are still hurting. So once we start learning that history and healing from that, those wounds and injustices that were caused then, then we as a community also start um, finding points of better unity because we've understood and healed those past hurts. The First World War cost millions of African lives both during the conflict itself and in the years that followed. Germany defeat led to the withdrawing of borders, colonial powers changed hands, and to many Africans, the end of the First World War did not bring hope for liberation. Decades will have to pass and another war will have to be fought before decolonization of Africa will finally be celebrated.